Hello and welcome. After nine videos discussing some features of the APQ120, the air-to-air -air and the AIM-7 employment, I went back to comments and feedback and noticed how several players struggle with the F4E in the air-to-air -air arena. This video discusses some macro issues players may encounter whilst playing in the Phantom 2. Let's get straight to business, shall we? I noticed that most problems fall into two categories, formamentis and modus operandi, with the underlying commonality of poor situational awareness. These categories refer to how you see things and how you act, because these aspects are paramount to building solid SA, and in a fight, the crew with better SA has the greatest chance to win. As said, there is no I win button in DCS. Some fighters may have advantages, even beyond realism sometimes, but eventually it comes down to the crew. In the Phantom's case, since the aircraft does not provide the same degree of information as more modern jets, the crew must change their understanding of the aircraft and then adapt by learning new ways of tackling the issues. There is no way of improving without putting in some effort. Now, if you're already familiar with the topics listed here, have a thought about them and try to change your perspective. If you are not, fasten your seatbelt, we're about to begin. For momentous, situational awareness, the APQ-120 as a search radar and the lack of data link. The single most disruptive feature new Phantom players encounter is the APQ-120, for this is more a self-defense and air-to-ground radar than a modern search radar. Therefore, it cannot match the range or the features of a, fa of a radar, such as the AN-APG-73 mounted in the F-18 Hornet. Even the contemporary AUG-9 of the Tomcat is vastly superior from our point of view, as it traded more air-to-air -air functionalities for air-to-ground features. In particular, the reduced power and lack of pulse Doppler capability mean the look-down performance is gravely affected. Moreover, the F4E does not feature a data link system comparable to the features provided by the Link 4 or the Link 16 many players are already familiar with. Changing how the crew creates SA is necessary for the F4E. The crew can't rely on internal systems to augment SA at the level of a 4th gen aircraft. Over fixating on systems and avionics may be more detrimental than beneficial. Use other means of building SA. Reliance on GCI or AIC. The points discussed so far already hint at the different approaches required of the crew when operating the Phantom. So, poor radar, no data link, only voice comms remain. Like many other third generation airplanes, the controller is a fundamental component of SA and successful operations. Unfortunately, the status of GCI and AIC in DCS is disappointing, and finding a human controller really is a must to make the best out of the Phantom. The GCI is the primary tool for medium and long range intercepts and to improve SA. This shift in perspective from fighter centric to controller based helps offset avionics limitations. A different type of aircraft. The picture we represented so far does look a bit grim, but it's not as bad as it appears though. The Phantom has two crew members, thus enabling better workload distribution and increased awareness by having four hands, four eyes, and two brains, ultimately providing more resilience to task saturation. Although the advantages of these aspects are intuitive, they become much more relevant when former fighter crew members discuss them. The following is an extract from a brilliant aircraft interview video where a former Tornado F3 pilot, Roy McIntyre, outlines how the F3 engaged the overall superior F15 and what they tried to achieve. F15s we worked a lot with. Um, they are always superior to the F3 across the whole range. Their radars generally generally were better than ours, except towards the end of the F3's life. Their weapon system was always better or the same, but the airframe itself performed better than the F3 in all regimes, uh, all heights, etc., etc. What's the advantage we had? Two people in the cockpit versus one. And that's where the weak point was, and that was the point that we attacked. How did we do that? We tried to confuse them. But anyway, how do we do it? At range, again, it's to destroy their situational awareness. So we would start to do some tricks. And by that, I mean, we're going into 90 degree turns, breaking apart. We're doing big height changes, basically to try and disappear out of their radar scan. Because you've got a single F-15 pilot who's flying his aircraft but is also trying to operate his radar and talk to his other elements in the formation. So we would get to the visual merge 
with some advantage, with equal or with no advantage. If we were no advantage visual merge, there's only one thing we would do, and that's try and get the heck out of Dodge as quickly as possible, which is generally charging straight through the fight as, with our hair on fire and then trying <laughs> to get safe airspace. And hopefully they wouldn't turn and chase us down. Uh, if they did, we're usually toast. Vis if it was equal, we're still looking by the nature of the F3 to get out the fight as quickly as possible. Hopefully, with cross cover and uh, if we came in with advantage we would take what we could quickly but again knowing that if we stayed and there were still live players there um, on the other side very quickly we could end up defensive so it was a heck of a bit of discipline really not to get too greedy when you finally break into the the fruit orchard to think I'll just have another apple. No, you've had two apples. Get, <laughs> get out of before the farmer arrives. Mm. Sort of style. In Primus, take advantage of the reduced workload, learn CRM and proper crew comms, and use contracts to define roles and responsibilities. Next, don't get over fixated on the engagement. Take whatever win you can without committing to a tactically unfavourable fight. Keep the energy high. Blow through and bug out. Somewhat connected to the previous point is the concept of blow-through. Blow-through, air-to-air, a directive call to continue straight ahead at the merge and do not become anchored with targets. This brevity communicates the intent of not stopping at the merge, but continuing through the situation. As mentioned, a fast phantom is a deadly phantom, but a slow one plays the game of the adversaries. Far too often, I see players pulling hard Gs and performing tight manoeuvres which bleed away all of the aircraft's energy. The Phantom has excellent flight characteristics and a thrust to weight ratio close to 1 when internal fuel decreases, a value similar to most contemporary aircraft such as the MiG-19 or MiG-21. On the other hand, the Phantom carries quite a considerable amount of internal fuel, almost four times the quantity of the MiG-19 and more than double the capacity of the MiG-21. This characteristic gives the F4E the option of reducing the considerable drag otherwise provided by external fuel tanks, then unloading and bugging out if the situation is not favourable. Bug out. Separation from a particular engagement or attack or operation with no intent to re-engage or return. Every aircraft has pros and cons. Older, non-fly-by-wire aeroplanes rely even more on the expertise of the pilot. Don't feel forced to accept the merge. Go through and extend, reposition or bug out. Phantom usually has sufficient weapons, power and endurance to maintain initiative and tactical advantage when transitioning from BVR to WVR. Formamentous observations. This first part of the discussion highlighted how the Phantom is a very different asset compared to most other modules. Therefore, habits must be changed and adapted to the new fighter. In the Phantom, in fact, the creation of situational awareness shifts from the data link to the controller and from the radar to the Mark 1 eyeballs. Moreover, porting one-to-one -one tactics used in a Fighting Falcon or other modern aircraft to the Phantom will rarely work. Instead, taking advantage of the two crew members is highly advised, and against peer but single sea aircraft, playing the task saturation card works exceptionally well. If the situation is unfavourable, using the Phantom 2 as a sort of more modern boom and zoom fighter, or as an opportunistic scavenger if you will, can provide better results than insisting on merging and pulling high Gs against better suited opponents in this type of gameplay. Modus operandi. Look outside. Combination of older avionics, lack of information condensation into sensors, and poor search radar capability, combined with older shorter range missiles and the presence of a second crew member, should prompt the crew to look outside much more than inside the cockpit. In real life, pilots spend much more time looking outside than at their avionics. The blunt reality is that, in some cases, the chances of spotting a target with the APQ-120 are inferior to Mark 1 eyeballs, especially with multiple pairs. The performance of weapons and the radar system never exclude the need to look outside the cockpit, even more so in the Phantom 2. Establishing a good lookout routine, both personal and within the crew and section, is fundamental. Human crew. There's little point dancing around it. 
The Phantom 2 performs best when both crew members are humans. Although Heat Blur has and is still working on improving Jester, nothing beats the proactivity and efficiency of a well-oiled and proficient human crew. There are many places where you can find pilots or wizards to play with, for instance Heat Blur's Discord to r slash hoggit on Reddit. If you have the opportunity, look for Virtual Soulmate! To really enjoy the Phantom, playing with another human is a necessity. Babysitting Jester can drain even more mental resources, impacting your essay. Play as the Wizzo or learn both seats. As a variation of the point above, if you are stuck with Jester, consider deactivating it when not required, flying with AFCS and from the Wizzo seat to fine tune the radar as needed. This suggestion should not come as anything new to Tomcat players, where Iceman was more than enough to hold course whilst the player fiddled with the radar in the back seat. Another lesson learned in the F-14 is the necessity of knowing the details of both cockpits. The pilot may not understand why, for example, the Wizzle cannot lock onto a target whose returns are partially displayed on the radar scope, a non-uncoming situation if the main lobe is also illuminating the ground. The pilot may therefore become impatient, leading to friction between the crew members and wasted time. A pilot familiar with the Wizzle toolset will instead immediately focus on the necessary steps to circumvent the problem and help the backseer obtain the lock. Heapler has done a great job with Jester, but you may find certain operations easier doing them on your own. Becoming familiar with both seats is necessary to understand the aircraft's limitations, avionics properties and quirks. Basics of Geometry more action-oriented players may not like the idea of refreshing high school maths concepts. However, they are key to understanding what is happening around the Phantom 2. Not only do they help to interpret the status quo, but also how the situation will evolve in the future, assuming parameters are unchanged, of course. A simple example of their importance is reported in the next discussion point. Basic geometry applies to both GCI, AIC and radar intercepts. It tangibly augments the ability of the crew to visualise the virtual battlefield in the near future, thus allowing them to react and manipulate it as needed. The temptation of jumping into the fray may be strong, but the time invested provides a tangible increase in the ability of the crew to build and use situational awareness. GCI slash AIC intercepts. The previous points of this discussion have highlighted how the Phantom relies on external input to augment the crew's SA since the APQ-120's abilities as a search radar are limited. One of the most common sources of external information is the controller, either airborne or ground-based. Although the AI controllers in DCS offer limited functions, they still provide contact details in bullseye or bra format. That's pretty much it, but it is definitely better than nothing. Once the crew has information such as bearing, range and altitude, they can then create a mental picture of the situation. This topic will have a dedicated video later on. So why is understanding the basics of geometry so very important? Well, for example, if a target is drifting left, assessed by the increase of the left antenna train angle, it may be the effect of a target travelling in such a direction, ergo right to left. Therefore, the Phantom's crew may consider correcting for an angle twice the ATA in the opposite direction aiming to make the intercept hotter, and then evaluate. The next update will likely report the target now drifting right, reinforcing this conviction. But, the same kind of reports may be provided for a target travelling from left to right, if, for example, the Phantom is faster than the contact and the geometry suits the scenario. The two situations described are opposite, but without understanding the basics of geometry, the crew will probably not realise it, or realize, realize it too late. Some basic radar tips. Ground returns are the greatest obstacle players moving from a pulse Doppler to a pulse radar have to get used to. Although pulse represents some advantages over pulse Doppler, such as the lack of Doppler related blind zones, this radar technology often provides a shorter direct detection range and the ground returns mentioned really hinder the scan operations. Experience and practice are important teachers, but the following tips should help you to put things into perspective. If the antenna elevation angle is greater than the bisector of the current radar cone height, the ground clutter should become less relevant, assuming no elevated terrain is in front of the aircraft. Low altitude operations benefit from reducing the gain knob to try and minimize the ground clutter. Once achieved, 
the PSTT lock is remarkably resilient. Obtaining a lock before decreasing altitude often simplifies the operation. Look down at shoot down is achievable, but it depends on whether the radar main lobe intercepts the target before the terrain. The APX-80's range is greater than the radar's. Interrogating every few seconds is a simple yet effective means of increasing the crew's situational awareness. Conclusions The first part of this video discussed how the crew should see the Phantom in a new light in order to succeed, such as changing habits and understanding the platform's strengths and differences from what the player may have flown in the past. The second part has provided practical points worth implementing. Everything said in this video is quite related. For example, the crew should stop relying entirely on the avionics to build SA. Therefore, the next step is to find an alternative, namely the controller. However, if the crew cannot translate numbers into a mental picture of the airspace, all they can do is go pure, then the resulting situational awareness will never be adequate. In the description below, you can find links to a series discussing the Phantom in the air-to-air -air arena, the APQ-120 Procedures and Intercept Geometry. Although DCS is a video game, it requires some effort and time investment. After all, many MOBAs, RTSs and even FPSs have quirks and rules to learn, so this should not come as a surprise when the game being played is as complex as a military flight simulator. Thanks for watching and take care. Hello everybody, I'm Ghostdog688. I do have a small YouTube channel of my own, um, and I have done a few episodes on a, uh, for a series known as Sam Brief, which may be of interest to the DCS community. But my primary reason for being here was just to help Kieran out a bit with his Flying Wire series uh, on the F4. Uh, it's an aircraft very close to my personal heart, and uh, I know that he doesn't always have the time to read out his own scripts, and I know that the AI system was a little bit of a distraction for many of the community. So I thought I'd try to be the change I'd like to see and help him with his script readings. I believe that he is going to provide a link to my channel somewhere below. And uh, you're certainly welcome to stop by, but I'd rather you just spend a little bit of time uh, and leave a like and a subscription to Caron's own videos uh, so that he can uh, get the attention uh, that he very much richly deserves for the effort he puts into these videos. Thank you very much and good day.